my name is Mackenzie Parks. And I'm Jordan Vanderbilt. And we're counseling psychology students at the University of Central Oklahoma. And today we'd like to talk to you a little bit about parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT. Today's video will contain three parts. In the first part, we'll introduce you to PCIT. In the second part, we'll talk about child-directed interaction. In the third part, we'll talk about parent-directed interaction. All right, we're gonna begin talking about the origins of PCIT. PCIT was developed in 1974 by Sheila Eiberg and combines elements of authoritative parenting, play therapy, and child behavior therapy. Once it was completed in 1974, it still lacked a need for demonstrating change. So standardized measures for assessing PCIT's uh, validity was necessary. The first decade of PCIT research involved standardizing three assessment tools. The Dyadic Child Interaction Coding System, the Iberg Child Behavior Inventory, and the Therapy Attitude Inventory. PCIT is basically an evidence-based treatment for families of children ages 2 to 7 diagnosed with disruptive behavior disorders. Uh, it combines elements of attachment, learning theory, systems theory, and behavior modification. Uh, it targets non-compliance and disruptive, uh, disruptiveness mainly. It uses direct coaching with the parent. It is assessment driven and it usually requires an average of about 13 weeks uh, or 13 weekly sessions. Here we have a representation of what some of the PCIT rooms look like. Uh, as you can see, there's a two-way mirror that allows for separation between the therapist and the parent and child. The small picture on the bottom shows the therapist with a microphone talking to the parent uh, using what they call a bug in the ear, which is a small uh, receiver in the parent's uh, ear to pick up what the therapist is talking about in, in their coaching. PCIT populations are typically children around the ages of 2 to 7 uh, with disruptive behavior disorders. Disorders that usually include ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, uh, children who are physically abused, high-functioning autism spectrum disorder, and several others. PCIT is basically a balance of two sequential factors, child-directed interaction, or CDI, and parent-directed interaction, or PDI. As you can see, uh, the child or the CDI portion of this incorporates positive interactions with the child. Uh, its design is to increase positive attention and decrease negative attention. The PDI portion consists of limit setting and predictability and follow through. Here we have a representation of the progression of a typical PCIT treatment, beginning with assessment, moving on to CDI teaching sessions, which usually last about one session. And that progresses on to the CDI coaching session, which usually range between three to six sessions overall. After that, once the parent has graduated from the CDI portion, they move to the parent-directed interaction uh, teaching session. And that usually also lasts about one session. Uh, and from there, they begin learning how to use the PDI uh, element as well as the CDI element in, in unison. Uh, the coaching session of the PDI uh, is usually between four to six. It's a little bit more advanced and sometimes requires a little bit longer to, uh, to really be able to do both. And after the coaching session, the assessment usually lasts one to two sessions uh, depending on how far along they've come uh, and any boosters uh, if needed in the future. The parent should undergo the initial intake without the child present. This helps for several reasons. Um, complaints and criticisms are often common topics uh, during the intake uh, interview with the parent. 
And that can be counterproductive to the therapeutic process if the child is present for that. So we, we try and ask that that, uh, that doesn't happen. Um, if possible, splitting it into two uh, sessions allows for the child to not be there on the first session and so that the intake process can be done without uh, that counterproductive element. And then the second portion, the child should be there so that we can establish a baseline and, and see where the parent and child uh, are and how they are, interact with one another. Assessment usually consists of three different um, behavior inventories. The Iberg Child Behavior Inventory, as well as the Sutter Iberg Student Behavior Inventory, are both measures used to record the child's behavior when not in session, say at home or at school, and is usually is brought back to the clinic so that it can be used for more information. The Dyadic Parent-Child Interaction Coding System Observation, or DPICS-3, is used while the parent and child are in session by the therapist to record everything that goes on and allows for them to track behavior over time. After the assessment is complete, it's typical to share the results with the parent, which will help introduce PCIT overall and also gives an opportunity to explain the first homework assignment. Child-Directed Interaction, or CDI, is the first stage in PCIT. This portion of PCIT is the uh, relationship enhancement portion. Uh, it uses direct coaching, focuses on giving positive attention to their child's positive behaviors during play, helps to build a more solid attachment uh, with the child, and overall, the basic rule of CDI is to follow the child's lead. The steps for teaching CDI uh, progress from the more easily attained to the more difficult. Beginning with a review of the homework, this will be consistent for every session. A special time daily practice, uh, which allows the parent and the therapist to kind of go over what that could consist of at home. The do skills the don't skills, strategic attention, tactical ignoring, modeling skills, coaching the parents in a role play scenario, and then assigning a new homework. Special time uh, is a time for the parents to have with their child at home uh, for about five minutes. And this seems like a short amount of time, but when it's listed or talked about as a special time. Even five minutes is actually a very good uh, way to show the child that the parent wants to spend time with them and can actually be used as a positive reinforcer. This five minute special time is often talked about with the therapist to determine uh, a specific place, maybe uh, what to do during that five minute special time. But essentially, it's a time to practice the CDI skills uh, at home while uh, between sessions. When teaching the CDI do skills, we often use an acronym to help the parents remember the different terms that follow for the do skills. Uh, and we use the acronym PRIDE, which represents praising the child's behavior, reflecting the child's statements and imitating, uh, describing the child's play, and using enthusiasm. Unfortunately, for teaching the CDI DOE skills, there's not a very good acronym like the PRIDE acronym for the DOE skills. However, they do consist of leading the play, giving commands, asking questions, and criticizing. Strategic attention is essentially focusing on the child's good behaviors and making it known that those are behaviors that are desired using enthusiasm. Uh, again, back to the do, the do skills. Uh, this could consist of playing quietly, sharing, taking turns, 
Essentially, we want to try and uh, catch the child being good. Tactical ignoring is basically the opposite of that. Parents should identify what child's behaviors or qualities that they would like to see diminished. And in doing so, they should tactically ignore these behaviors. Uh, such behaviors can be whining, talking back, nagging, and so on. Some behaviors, however, cannot be ignored, mainly because they may pose a danger to the child or others, uh, such as standing on top of furniture, throwing or breaking toys, uh, banging on an observation room window, uh, or hitting or biting uh, a parent. Oftentimes, therapists utilize uh, modeling of the skills and using role play scenarios with the parent uh, and child. Therapists will briefly demonstrate and describe the CDI skills as they demonstrate it. This allows the parent to really see for themselves exactly what we're expecting of them uh, in these CDI skills. Uh, sometimes, if that's not a possibility, a video segment can uh, display uh, how to do some of the specific modeling uh, of these skills. A role play can consist of one therapist acting as the child and another as the coach, uh, while the parent plays themselves, essentially. Uh, two brief uh, role plays of about two minutes each are recommended uh, to help the parent really try and understand and, and have a good understanding of uh, what is expected of them. Homework assignments, again, consist of the five-minute special time at home. Uh, this is a continuous homework assignment that we ask of the parents throughout the entire session, uh, the CDI session as well as the, the PDI. Uh, because these will build on each other, we want them to practice these as often as possible. Uh, the homework assignment will usually come with a homework recording sheet. The CDI homework sheet identifies uh, what was done on which day, uh, how long they were able to spend doing that, and any problems that may have arised during the five minute special time at home. In coaching CDI, therapists will utilize uh, the bug in the ear microphone to communicate with the parent as they interact with the child. Uh, this is basically a small microphone that is placed in the parent's ear uh, so that the therapist can talk to them, um, providing them with labeled praise uh, when necessary, and often uh, tactical ignoring if they notice the parent doing something that maybe isn't exactly what they should do. Um, essentially, therapists will utilize and model the same methods that they ask of the parent during the coaching session. Uh, again, using the strategic attention when the parent does something uh, that they would like to see more often, and tactical ignoring if the parent displays a behavior that they don't want to see uh, anymore. Uh, and also, the parents are asked to avoid criticism and, and give labeled praise to any positive behaviors that they uh, witness in the parent. This helps build rapport uh, and it models the CDI skills that we are asking of the parents. A CDI coaching session follows four different steps, beginning with a check-in and review of the homework. This usually lasts about 10 minutes or so. And then we have the coding of the CDI skills. This is a five minute portion of time that the therapist will code the parent without actually interacting using the bug in the ear microphone. After that, the coaching begins and usually lasts around 35 minutes. And this is where the bug in the ear microphone is utilized in the, for the parent so that the therapist can help coach the parent through all the different uh, elements that they uh, run into in that 35 minute period. And closes with feedback on progress and homework assignments, which usually lasts about 10 minutes. Coaching of the CDI skills usually begins with a check-in and homework review. This allows the parent to address the therapist about any questions that they may have come across. The check-in should also include a review of the do and don't skills. Therapists should expect non-compliance with homework, but be proactive about problem-solving these issues. So 
it's likely that at the beginning, especially, parents won't fully comply with the homework. But the more that you can identify that this will be a reward uh, for the child in the future, as long as they continue to establish it, uh, the more they'll likely understand its benefit and its necessity. Coding of the CDI skills is used at the beginning of each session and is the five minute special time while in session using the DPICS3 form. The coding of the CDI skills is the first five minutes of each session and allows the parent to track the progress uh, between sessions and also allows us to track their progress to see once to see if they've acquired mastery uh, of the CDI skills. This, this mastery uh, acquisition of the CDI skills will ultimately lead the parent into the next phase, or PDI. In coaching the CDI skills, therapists typically, typically start with the easier, uh, more attainable skills and progress on to the more difficult. And at the beginning of these sessions, you also, as a therapist, want to be a little bit more directive, eventually progress to a less directive approach. A good way to help a parent uh, who may be needing a little bit of understanding about something that they could fix or correct or maybe do a little better, it's often good to use what we call a feedback sandwich. A nice slice of labeled praise followed by a small, delicate, suggestion of what they could do better and then follows with another healthy slice of labeled praise, hence the name feedback sandwich. The homework assignment is usually the last part of each coaching session and again typically consists of a five minute special time uh, each day uh, that the parent spends with the child to practice the CDI skills. So after the parent and child meet mastery criteria for the CDI portion, which is the relationship building aspect of PCIT, we then move on to um, PDI, or parent-directed interaction portion of PCIT, which is the discipline component. Um, in PDI, we teach parents uh, skills for improving child compliance and how to decrease disruptive behaviors in the children. Um, Parents learn how to give good commands. They learn how to praise effectively when the child complies. They also learn how to use the timeout procedure for non-compliance. They also learn how to establish standing house rules. So the progression of PDI is the same as CDI. You start with a teaching session. Sometimes that can be two sessions. Um, then you progress to the PDI coaching sessions, which depend on the progress of the parent um, usually about four to six sessions. Then after they have met mastery criteria, you finish PCIT with a graduation session and a feedback session. Sometimes parents wonder why compliance is good for their children to learn. Um, we teach parents that the benefit of compliance reaches many aspects of the child's life as well as the parent's life. Um, compliance leads to good socialization skills in children so they have an easier time adjusting when they get into school. Um, this, this treatment is for preschool age children, so they are right around the age where they're learning socialization skills to follow directions in school, to obey the teacher. It also helps children learn how to complete self-help tasks by themselves. So things like hygiene tasks, brushing teeth, uh, putting on their clothes by themselves, learning how to tie their shoes, putting things away, um, a lot of times when children have behavior problems, parents will just do these things for the child instead of having the child learn how to do them themselves. It also helps them uh, reduce their anxiety. A lot of people think that children have um, a tendency to want to run the show because it's, uh, it reduces their anxiety. Um, when in fact, running the show actually produces more anxiety for children because uh, according to PCIT therapists, children um, need structure and they need safety and they need people to rely on that they know will always keep them safe and there is structure. So running the show for children is actually anxiety provoking and learning to comply will decrease that anxiety. 
Children need structure, as I said before, and structure to PCIT therapists is comprised of consistency, predictability, and follow-through. These components are necessary for providing structure within the PCIT format. Um, consistency is providing the same commands the same way on a good day as you did on a bad day and vice versa. Predictability is always providing the same um, consequences for behavior on a good day than on a bad day. Follow through is always giving the same um, co consequence procedure um, on a good day as you did on a bad day. A lot of parents wonder why we should use the manual's exact wording. Within PCIT, the discipline procedures are taught as exact wording and the parents are taught to memorize these consequences and the timeout procedure and, and all of the procedures taught are in exact wording. And we tell parents because it adds to that predictability uh, component of PDI. Um, each time the child receives a timeout warning or receives some sort of consequence, they learn very quickly that it will be the same no matter how they behave. Even if it's uh, a different version of non-compliance or disruptive behavior, it will always be followed through with the same consequence. So in order to do that, we have to have the parents learn to memorize the exact wording. Um, it also avoids the parent adding extra emotion into their commands and into their responses to their children, um, like raising their voice or adding extra words like saying, didn't you hear what I said? Um, using the exact wording of the manual avoids that, which a lot of parents don't know that they're doing. In the PDI teaching sessions, parents learn how to give commands. They learn what obeying and disobeying look like behaviorally. They learn what to do when the child complies and what to do when the child does not comply. They also learn backups for uh, when the timeout procedure doesn't work for noncompliance. And then after they are taught all of those skills, we then practice in session with role plays with the therapist. The first step of the PDI teaching session is explaining the use of compliance exercises. Um, so PCIT therapists view problem behaviors as falling into two categories primarily, non-compliance and disruptiveness. Non-compliance is refusing to do what you're told to do. Disruptiveness is doing things you're told not to do. So the first part of PDI that we address is non-compliance um, because we can't address disruptive behavior if the child doesn't know how to comply with the command. So the second step of the PDI teaching session is teaching parents how to give effective instructions or commands. The first rule is giving direct rather than indirect commands. The second rule is positively stated commands. Third, giving one command at a time. Fourth, specific commands rather than vague. Fifth, age appropriate commands. Sixth, given politely and respectfully. Seventh, explained before they are given or after they are given. Eight, used only when necessary. The third step of the PDI teaching session is teaching parents how to determine if their child has obeyed. So we discuss with parents what compliance looks like and what non-compliance looks like behaviorally in their children. So compliance is completing the requested behavior. So if the command is, please hand me that red block, and the child places the red block in your hand, that is considered compliance. If the child hands you the red block with a bad attitude, so if they hand it to you while saying, Ugh, fine, that's still considered compliance because the child completed the behavior. If the child does something called undoing, that's still considered compliance, and what that is, is you say, please hand me the red block, the child puts the red block in your hand, then waits a second and then takes it back, that's what we call undoing, and that's still considered compliance because they literally completed the command that you requested. Um, sometimes children will overdo the command. They might hand you a mound of red blocks. That is still considered compliance. Um, sometimes children will comply um, after you give them a visual cue, but only after partial compliance. For example, if you say, please hand me that red block, and you point to your hand, and the child pushes the red block closer to you, that's considered partial compliance. 
And if you give them a visual cue by pointing to the block and pointing to your hand, and then the child places the block in your hand, that's considered compliance. Now, if the child does not place the block in your hand after you give the visual cue, that's considered non-compliance. Other examples of non-compliance include doing something slightly differently than the parent's request. So if you say, please hand me the red block, and the child scoots it close to you but doesn't hand it to you, that's considered non-compliance. If they do something called dawdling, which is basically a child's version of stalling, so if you say, please hand me that red block, and the child picks it up and says, let's pretend it's a helicopter and races around the room first before handing it to you, that's considered non-compliance. Um, if the child plays deaf, so if they pretend that they can't hear you, that's considered non-compliance. And again, this is addressed in the rules how to give um, effective commands because you have to make them age appropriate. And of course, the child has to be able to hear you. Um, and these are things that are addressed in the coaching session to make sure that, they, that the parent is giving effective commands. Um, and again, if the child partially complies by scooting it, and then does not comply after you give them a visual cue, that's considered non-compliance and you proceed with the consequence. The fourth and fifth steps of the PDI teaching session are teaching consequences for obeying and disobeying. So the consequences for obeying are enthusiastic labeled praise for making a good choice and also for avoiding timeout. And this is important to include both of those aspects in your praise so that the child learns very quickly the relationship between non-compliance and timeout. Um, and after the child has learned that relationship, you can remove that portion of your praise. So in the beginning of PDI coaching sessions, you would praise by saying, thank you so much for making a good choice by handing me the red block and for avoiding timeout. After the child learns the relationship and they begin to comply more, you can, you, you, you can just say, Thank you so much for making a good choice by handing me that red block. So the fifth step of the PDI teaching session is teaching parents consequences for disobeying. And this usually takes up the largest portion of the PDI teaching session just because it's the reason why they're there. So the consequence for disobeying that we teach parents is the timeout chair. And uh, the timeout chair is a procedure that we use because it can be given uh, multiple times safely. Um, whereas spanking cannot be given multiple times safely, um, you can use it in public by doing a different version of it with a blanket or a chair that you can take with you safely. And it can also be given immediately after disobeying, so it gets very strong stimulus control very quickly. So the timeout procedure looks a little something like this. I would like to make the top of my tower red. Please hand me that red block. If the child does not comply, you say, if you don't hand me that red block, you're going to have to sit on the timeout chair. If the child does not comply, you escort the, the child to timeout chair while saying, you didn't do what I told you to do, so you have to sit on the chair. Once placed on the chair, the parent says, stay on the chair until I tell you that you can get off, and quickly walk away. After three minutes, plus five seconds of quiet, go back to the chair and say to the child, you are sitting quietly in the chair. Are you ready to come back and hand me the red block? If the child indicates that he or she is ready by uh, nodding or getting up to go to the table, or even if they run to the table while yelling no at you, that indicates that the child is ready and you proceed with the, you go back to the table and proceed with the original command. Although you do not repeat the command because you just repeated it by asking if the child was ready to go back to the table and hand you the red block. So instead you go back to the table and point to the red block while pointing to your hand. So you give them a visual cue. After they give you the red block, you simply acknowledge by saying okay or a very simple thank you instead of enthusiastic labeled praise. Um, and the reason for that is because we want the child to learn that when they eventually comply, they only get a very simple acknowledgement rather than praise. But if the child initially complies, they get very enthusiastic labeled praise, and that attention is reinforcing for the child. So we want the child to learn the difference between initial compliance and eventual compliance. After the child complies with the original command and you give a simple acknowledgement, you give another similar command, 
and if they obey, you give them enthusiastic label of praise. And that's so that the child can have another opportunity to get that enthusiastic label of praise and that reinforcing attention. And then you go right back to your CDI skills thereafter. And that's so that we can keep the relationship skills built, we can keep the interactions with the parent and child positive and reinforcing for both parties involved. So a lot of parents have a lot of questions about timeout issues that may come up. Um, the first one is what if the child refuses to walk to the timeout chair? And this is very common with children with disruptive behavior problems. So what we use is what's called the barrel carry. You wrap your arms around the child's chest with their arms free and you stand up. The child's back should be against your chest and their arms and legs should not be contained. And you quickly walk to the timeout chair. Now the reason why we don't keep their arms tucked in is because a child can hurt themselves very easily. Um, they can feel very constricted and can start to panic and it can become uh, traumatizing to children. So we simply pick them up by their chest, firmly but gently carry them to the chair and set them down. Um, and parents are instructed to ignore all verbalizations and ignore all strikes that the child might do. Um, and this is because any attention given to that behavior, even if it's painful for the parent, reinforces that behavior. The second question that parents have is what if the child breaks the five seconds of silence? And if the child does not maintain silent behavior for five seconds, you simply restart the five second count, not the three minute count. What if the child complies after the first few words of the warning? So if you give the child the, the command, please hand me the red block, the child does not comply and you say, if you do not hand me the red block, you will have to go to timeout, but before you can finish, the child hands you the red block. You finish the warning and then enthusiastically praise the compliance. And this is so that we can teach the child the relationship between um, complying in the middle of a warning, you're still gonna you're still gonna get that very boring, very predictable warning, but you'll still get praise. So if the child complies after the warning is started, we want to give them that very boring and predictable warning as a slight punishment for not complying originally. What if the child agrees to comply on the way to timeout? If the child agrees to comply while you stand up and try to escort them to the timeout chair, you still follow through with the procedure. You still say, you didn't do what I told you to do quickly enough, so now you have to go to the timeout chair. And this is so that the child still receives that very predictable, consistent follow through with non-compliance. Um, and if you do let the child comply on the way to timeout and you don't follow through with the timeout procedure, then the child learns that he doesn't need to comply until you stand up or until you give the timeout warning. So we want the child to learn to comply with the initial command instead of complying when the parent stands up. If a child takes a toy to timeout, you quickly remove the toy from the child's hands without acknowledging it. If you verbally acknowledge the toy in the child's hand, the child receives that as reinforcing attention and they will likely do it every time. What if the child puts himself in timeout chair instead of complying with the command? Sometimes children will take control of the timeout procedure by putting themselves in the timeout chair first before the parent can do it. Um, if the child does that, you simply follow them to the chair and give them the timeout warning by saying, if you don't hand me the red block, you're going to have to sit in the timeout chair. If the child stays in the chair or does anything other than complying, then you follow through with the timeout procedure. And you simply say, you didn't do what I told you to do, so now you have to sit in the timeout chair. Stay on the chair until I tell you that you can get off, and you walk away. And this is so that the parent is demonstrating control over the timeout procedure instead of letting the child take control of the procedure and timeout becomes less fun for the child and you're removing the reinforcement from that procedure and you're making it a punishment. Which behaviors should parents ignore and not ignore? Parents should ignore the child verbalizing any and all verbalizations. Um, they should ignore bathroom requests and if the child is potty training or even if they're past potty training age, it's encouraged for parents to take children to the restroom before every session. 
This includes homework sessions at home that they do together. And that is to avoid the risk of uh, the child actually needing to go to the bathroom um, so that the parent is comfortable ignoring bathroom requests because oftentimes they can be attention-seeking behaviors. Um, parents are told to ignore um, and avoid direct eye contact with the child while still being able to watch the child out of their peripherals. Um, behaviors that parents cannot ignore are timeout escape. If the child gets out of the chair, we cannot ignore that. Um, and that procedure, the, the backup procedure to that is taught um, later in the teaching session. Um, parents cannot ignore scooting or vigorous uh, rocking of the timeout chair. And this is simply because it's dangerous and also because it can become very reinforcing to children. It can become uh, a game and then timeout can become fun. Um, parents cannot ignore standing on the chair. Um, a lot of times toddlers will do this, but we have to make sure that they are safe and we follow through with the backup to the timeout procedure. So the sixth step of the PDI teaching session is teaching parents what to do when the timeout chair procedure doesn't work. So backups for the timeout procedure are the timeout room or the swoop and go technique. The timeout room is a separate room um, with no stimulation or attention. A lot of times in therapy rooms, um, this can be a small, about five by five, attached room that has access to the therapy playroom as well as the observation room where the therapist uh, watches. And there shouldn't be any electrical outlets, there shouldn't be any uh, pictures, no toys, um, no stimulation or attention for the child. And when the child is taken to the timeout room, they are, they are to stay there for one minute plus five seconds of quiet. And then after that, they're taken back to the timeout chair and they have to stay in the timeout chair for the three minutes plus five seconds required time. The swoop and go technique is similar, but if you don't have a timeout room, you use this technique instead. Um, and instead of taking the child to a different room, you quickly swoop all the toys up into a bucket or a bag and you quickly leave the room. The child is to stay in the playroom uh, the same time as the timeout room for one minute plus five seconds of quiet. And then after that, you come back into the room and take them back to the timeout chair for the three minutes plus five seconds. So the timeout room procedure um, looks a little bit some, something like this. If the child escapes the chair, you bring the child back to the chair saying, you got off the chair before I said you could get off. If you get off the chair again, you will have to go to the timeout room. Stay here until I tell you that you can get off. And this warning is a once-in-a-lifetime warning. This warning is only given the first time the child gets off the chair. And that is so that the child quickly learns that when they get out of the chair, they will immediately go to the timeout room instead of getting that warning, which might be reinforcing the behavior. So you give the warning, and then you begin the three-minute timing again. If the child escapes again, you say, you got off the chair before I said you could, so you have to go to the timeout room and then you bring the, timeout, the child to the timeout room or you do the swoop and go technique and you begin the one, timing, the one minute timing. After the one minute plus five seconds of quiet, take the child back to the timeout chair and say, stay on the chair until I tell you that you can get off. Then you begin the three minute timing plus five seconds of quiet. This procedure is repeated until the child stays on the chair for three minutes plus five seconds. Um, and the swoop and go technique is the same. You just say, instead of saying you're going to have to go to the timeout room, you say, I will have to take the toys and wait outside. So the last step of the PDI teaching session is coaching parents as they role play the discipline skills. So you role play the timeout procedure, you role play the timeout room and the timeout chair. Um, and it's important that the therapist tells the parents not to use the timeout procedure before the next session. And this is very important so that the parent doesn't use the timeout procedure incorrectly at home and set in some patterns that may be really hard to undo later on. So you tell the parents, do not use the timeout procedure until we practice it together with the child in the coaching sessions. So the homework for the PDI teaching session is to review the PDI handouts and the parents are given all of this information in written form and they're told to review it all and to try to memorize all of the warnings and the sayings. Um, and they're also to do the CDI homework, the continuing the special time with their child, 
um, every day so that they can keep that relationship very strong, keep it a positive interaction, because we can't use the parent's attention as a reinforcement if it's not still fun for the child. So we really encourage that CDI homework. So after the PDI teaching session, we move on to the PDI coaching sessions. And like I said before, these are usually about four to six one-hour sessions, depending on the progress of the parent. The PDI coaching sessions are basically a session long of doing the CDI skills with punctuated by moments of command sequences. So what we teach in these PDI coaching sessions is how to give commands and how to follow through with those consequences that we had talked about in the teaching session. And then after each command, we go back to the CDI skills so that the interaction is maintained positively and the child actually enjoys their time with their parent, as well as the parent enjoying the time. The PDI coaching sessions are broken up into about five segments. The first, very similar to the CDI coaching sessions, the first is check-in and homework review, about 10 minutes. Um, the second is the coding of the CDI skills, and we do code the CDI skills throughout uh, PCIT. And this is just so that we can make sure that the parents are maintaining those skills and maintaining the mastery of those skills. And then we move on to coding of PDI skills, and each of these coding segments are about five minutes. Um, the coding of the PDI skills is not done in the first PDI coaching session, and this is because the parents haven't had a chance to practice those skills that they had just learned, so we don't score them on them in that first coaching session. Then we move on to the actual coaching segment of the PDI coaching sessions, and this is usually about 30 minutes. Um, if you have two parents present, then you break that up into about 10 minutes per parent. And the last step of the coaching session is feedback and homework assignment. So check-in and homework review uh, begins by collecting and scoring that um, Iberg Child Behavior Inventory Sheet that they take home every week. And then you talk about any problems that they have with their special time homework. Um, and later on, when they're doing their PDI homework, you discuss any issues that came up for them during that time. Um, in the first PDI coaching session, um, like I said, they don't do the PDI coding. And also in this first session, the therapist explains to the child the timeout procedure. And this is just so that the child is informed on what the consequences will be and so that they're not surprised by the procedure, which can cause some other behavior problems that we want to avoid at all costs. So the five minute coding of the CDI skills uh, is done on this sheet, the parent CDI coding sheet. And it's about five minutes followed by immediate feedback um, just briefly telling the parent, okay, you're doing great, you're meeting all the CDI mastery skills, let's move on to PDI. Um, and if they need time to improve their CDI skills, you give them about 10 minutes. Um, you can coach them through that 10 minutes just to get them back up to mastery level. And then the five minute coding of PDI skills um, is done on the PDI coding sheet. And for about five minutes, you observe the, child, the parent directing the interaction and giving commands. Um, and then you follow up with a feedback sandwich. Um, right after that. Um, and again, this is omitted during the first coaching session. So some therapist guidelines for PDI coaching, um, giving only one instruction at a time, uh, telling the parents what to do instead of no, don't, stop, instead of telling them what not to do. In very rare instances, you would tell them not to do something, but only if they are doing it repeatedly. Mostly you want to tell them what to do. Coaching nonverbal as well as verbal behavior. Uh, using ample praise, particularly when parents follow through with instructions. Providing constant reassurance to the parent, um, especially in the beginning when parents are very uncertain, very uh, uncomfortable with the process, you provide lots of labeled praise and reassurance. Um, include relaxation techniques such as deep breathing uh, if needed. Sometimes parents get very angry, very uh, upset when their child misbehaves, so we teach them those brief relaxation techniques. Um, being active and directive. Uh, when appropriate, incorporate humor to diffuse tension. Sometimes parents react very well to that, and it's up to the therapist when and how much humor to use. Project confidence and decisiveness. This is really important with parents who are very uncertain. Um, again, pro uh, projecting confidence and decisiveness helps the parent to feel more comfortable with the process. Um, using a running commentary or constant talking approach to distract parents during conflictual situations. 
So talking to them constantly at a low, low rate, at a low voice, helping them to work through those conflictual situations with their child. When parents become agitated, use a coaching voice that is softer and more monotone with a very even rate of speech. And again, this is to coach them through those situations where they might start to become upset or start to become reactive to their child. Um, make quick decisions when questionable circumstances arise. The criteria for meeting the PDI skills, the mastery level of PDI skills, include giving at least four commands, of which at least 75% must be effective. And by effective, we mean meeting those eight rules that we had talked about in the teaching session for giving effective commands. Um, the second criteria is showing at least 75% correct follow-through after effective commands. So labeled praise after obeying and giving the timeout warning after disobeying. The third mastery criteria, if the child requires a timeout that begins during the observation period, the five minute observation period, the parent must successfully follow through with the PDI procedure, with the timeout procedure. And if the, if the child doesn't give the parent an opportunity to demonstrate the timeout procedure correctly, then the parent can do a role play with the therapist to demonstrate those skills. The last uh, portion of the coaching session is debriefing and homework assignment. So for about 10 minutes, you do a debriefing and feedback with the parents. And this is so that you can address parent concerns, you can answer any questions that they might have, and you can also give them specific feedback using the, the PDI skills coding sheet that you had used uh, in the beginning of the session, and also if you observed anything that you wanted to talk with them about. Um, and the feedback should be very specific and it should be given in a feedback sandwich format so that the parent has not only some suggestions for improvement, but also some praise for specific behaviors that they did. The homework for PDI coaching involves the five minute CDI special time, followed immediately by 10 minutes of PDI time. And you do this in a graduated fashion. So in the beginning of the PDI coaching sessions, during the 10 minutes of PDI, you do very simple commands. So you start with play commands, like please hand me the red block, or other commands that you can use during play situations. And then later on, during uh, other later portions of therapy, you do homework assignments like giving more boring commands or clean up commands, things that the child uh, is less likely to want to do. Um, and the idea is to get cross-setting generalization. So you want the child to really have a lot of practice of obeying commands and getting lots of praise for obeying commands so that they can use these skills and learn to comply in other settings like school. The uh, first part of PDI coaching, when you first assign the PDI homework, looks a little bit like this. You do the, um, after you do the five minute CDI of special time, you go to the 10 minutes and it's 10 minutes of a play situation. So for each day, you check yes or no, and you indicate whether you use the timeout chair and if there were any issues. Um, you indicate if you use the timeout room procedure and if there were any issues with that. Later on in homework, you would use the PDI with a cleanup situation or other selected situations. So you indicate yes or no if you did the cleanup after CDI. And this would look something like uh, five minutes of CDI special time and then you go to your 10 minutes of PDI, and for that 10 minutes, you would use cleanup commands during that 10 minutes. And then you indicate if you use the timeout chair during cleanup, um, if you used other PDI commands during that time, and then if you use the timeout chair during that time, and the timeout room. So it gets a little bit more involved as PDI moves on. Towards the end of therapy, we talk about house rules with the parents. And house rules are standing rules that address the other category of problem behavior, that address disruptiveness. And again, non-compliance, which we had just addressed with the uh, PDI coaching and teaching, is refusing to do what you're told to do. So once we have compliance at a good rate, we move on to addressing disruptiveness, which is doing what you're told not to do. So house rules address disruptiveness. And a, a few examples of house rules include no jumping on the furniture, no profanity, um, dad's office is off limits, things like that that are standing house rules. So when you're establishing house rules, they should be explained to the child in advance. And they should be uh, developmentally appropriate where the child can understand 
and they should be adequately described in advance so the child has time to really learn and know what the standing house rule means. Um, when they disobey the house rule, they should always be given a timeout without a warning. Um, after the timeout, you should provide labeled praise for behavior that is incompatible with the behavior that broke the house rule. So, for example, if your house rule is no jumping on the bed, and you catch your child jumping on the bed, then you give them a timeout without warning. So you simply say, you are jumping on the bed, which is a house rule, so you, now you have to go to the timeout chair. So after the timeout, after the child has maintained the three minutes plus five seconds in the timeout chair, you would praise something that is incompatible with that behavior. So if they're sitting on the bed now, you would say, thank you so much for sitting on the bed instead of jumping. So you provide label praise for a behavior that's incompatible with the behavior that broke the rule. So you should only have about two active house rules maximum. And by active, we mean house rules that are still standing because there's still a risk that they may be broken. If a house rule has been um, maintained and it hasn't been broken for a while and it's not a risk anymore, then it's not considered active. Once you have the house rules established and the child understands what they are, you incorporate that into the PDI homework. And the PDI homework sheet looks something like this. So you have PDI homework with running commands and house rules. So you indicate yes or no whether you did positive command practice. Um, you indicate if you did timeout chair for running commands or timeout chair for house rules, and if you did timeout room, and if there were any issues with any of those procedures. The criteria for graduation is the uh, Iberg Child Behavior Inventory Intensity Scale Raw Score has to be 114, and this score is basically represents how the child has been behaving at home or at school. So it's behavior outside of the clinic. Uh, the parent's CDI skills must be at mastery level, which we had talked about uh, previously. The parent's PDI skills must be at mastery level, which we also talked about previously. Parents report confidence in PCIT skills. So if the parent is still very unsure about uh, whether the skills are working or whether they can work, even if the data shows that it is working, then they're still not considered ready for graduation. So we do need parents to have that confidence in the mastery of the PCIT skills. Um, and also the family has learned and practiced house rules and public behavior procedures if they needed to. Public behavior procedures can be discussed and problem solved with the parents um, and they can be practiced in session with the child if the parent reports that they're having problems in public with uh, problem behavior. So for graduation, the major therapeutic goals is to help parents recognize the magnitude of progress, also to link progress to the use of these skills that they have learned. So linking progress of the child's compliance improving and their overall behavior improving, we want to link that to the specific skills that they've been practicing at home during that homework time. Um, we also, one of the goals is to increase parents' sense of competence in dealing with future problems. So we want parents to walk away from PCIT really feeling confident that they have the tools they need to address future problems as they may arise. Also for the graduation session, you want to review progress using a graph that we have been constructing during therapy um, using the ECBI or Iberg Child Behavior Inventory scores. So each time the parent brings that, that uh, report in to each session, we record that score and we're basically constructing a graph to show them at the end of therapy. So that helps to reinforce that relationship between practicing these skills at home and the improvement of the behavior. Um, we also give a blue ribbon for the child. So we're really reinforcing that. We're really giving them a lot of praise and attention. And also we give a graduation certificate for the parents so that we provide them with lots of attention and praise uh, and reinforcement. So that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for watching our video. We hope that you enjoyed it and you learned a lot about PCIT and uh, we hope that you can use these skills in your own life and teach them to other parents in your life. And thank you so much.